Hello and welcome to this video lecture on employee benefit plans. For an HR professional, the bewildering array of benefit plans to be administered requires a keen attention to multiple laws and to the demands of both employees and applicants alike. For example, with recruitment specialists, an enticing benefit plan can help their job immensely. For an employee facing the choice between two similarly paying job offers, the one with the more attractive benefit plan often gets the nod, so to speak. Let's get started. There are a plethora of different types of employee benefit plans. In this lecture, I will cover some of the major aspects of employee benefits with an emphasis on the major laws covering the provision of employee benefits, some but not all of the various types or categories of benefit plans, and a brief overview of employee retirement plans. So let's start by taking a walk through history as we move on. The SSA is a law that governs all workers in the USA. The Social Security Act of 1935 was passed at the height of the Great Depression. Until then, each person was solely responsible for planning for their own retirement, and there was no protection, financial or otherwise, against loss of income from disability or unemployment unless graciously provided by an individual employer. Very few companies offered payment to employees who were disabled on the job or forced into unemployment because of a reduction in force by the company. Nor did companies pay the surviving members of an employee's family in case of the employee's death on the job, let alone contributing money aside for employees' eventual retirement. Therefore, the SSA gives protection to workers in the event that they get laid off or injured or if they die either on or off the job and provides for a very, very small pension administered by the federal government. These benefits are not free, however. Both the employee and the employer must each pay 6.2% of the employee's pay before other taxes are taken out into a pool of funds. Self-employed persons must pay both shares of the 6.2% in the form of a so-called self-employment tax, which equals 12.4%, to offset the fact that no employer is paying anything into the fund on their behalf. So if you are an independent contractor and receive a Form 1099 from the company for whom you did some work, you must pay 12.4% of the total 1099 income before you can even determine how much of the remaining pay you must send to dear old Uncle Sam. Let's move on. ERISA is a very important safeguard for employees' pensions. However, more and more companies are moving away from pensions and instead are offering a contribution to a different sort of retirement plan instead. Much more on that later in the presentation. The Employee Retirement Income Security Act was passed in 1974 to protect non-Social Security pensions, life insurance, and disability payments to employees of the firms who had set up a sort of a trust fund to finance these things. These sorts of benefits help employers recruit good employees. In the 50s and 60s, 1950s and 60s, remember those years? It was not nearly as uncommon as it is today for a company to provide a guaranteed income or pension upon their retirement after some agreed upon length of service. However, ERISA only covers plans that are so-called qualified plans and therefore that meet certain standards of acceptability to the federal government. The feds won't cover or guarantee just any plan. These plans have strict oversight requirements and are limited in the type of investments which they pursue. Ponzi schemes and your brother-in-law's harebrained scheme to turn water into fuel for a flying car won't qualify. This is a good thing because in order for firms to meet the guaranteed pensions to employees when the employees retire 30 or 40 years in the future, the firm must invest wisely. The government helps safeguard the proper investments that companies pay into on your behalf. Interestingly, some firms are allowed to borrow from their own funds 
but only under severely restricted rules. Of note is that ERISA does not cover pension plans provided by government agencies, weird, or by churches, or plans made to cover workers' compensation, unemployment, or disability laws, or plans made outside the U.S., even if by a U.S. company. Why? Well, this is likely because of some of the things are just too risky for the government to guarantee. Let's move on. COBRA has been a life-saving benefit plan for some, literally. It has saved lives of persons who were able to keep their health insurance after no longer working for a company. The Consolidated Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1986 was very important until the passage of the Affordable Care Act. Under this law, COBRA, employers must make health insurance coverage available for the same rate as they would pay to former employees and their families in the event of termination of employment. However, they are, the company that is, is allowed to charge a small percentage, usually around 2% additional to offset the administrative fees endured by the now former employer on behalf of the now former employee. This coverage is available to the actual former employee, their spouse and dependents upon not only termination of employment, but upon the divorce or death in the family or of the current employee. That is, if an employee gets divorced and the company covers their spouse and dependents, then the spouse and the dependents can maintain their coverage at their own expense, of course. If the employee dies either on the job or off the job, then the surviving spouse and dependents get coverage too, at their own expense. But this coverage is not indefinite. It ends after either 18 or 36 months, depending upon the qualifying guidelines. And of course, remember that the former employee or their spouse and dependents must pay for their own insurance. The point of the law is that insurance cannot just be canceled when an employee leaves the firm. They have at least a year and a half to get new coverage of their own. This law also helps many people with severe or life-threatening illness keeping their coverage if they quit or lose their job, perhaps because of the illness. In other words, firing a really sick employee is not a uh, death sentence, as the former employee can keep the coverage, but again, at their own expense. Let's move on. Well, Congress didn't go far enough in its pension protection plans, so it passed the Older Workers Benefit Protection Act in 1990. For this, I am truly thankful, as an old guy. This law is technically an amendment to the Age Discrimination in Employment Act of 1967, and it prohibits discrimination in early retirement and other benefit plans. So here's how it works. It imposes strict rules about having employees sign release forms regarding the relinquishment of their rights to sue for age discrimination. Previously to this, companies had employees sign away their rights to sue based upon age discrimination after they reached 40 years of age and qualified for protection under the ADEA. Companies can still ask you to sign a waiver, but it must be voluntary and in non-technical language so everyone can understand it. You also have the right to consult an attorney. It seems that some unscrupulous companies tried to get some unsuspecting employees to sign a waiver of their right to sue based upon age discrimination, and just before they reached an age at which they would qualify for a pension, the company would fire them so they wouldn't have to pay their pension, just so the company could save money. Sad, but true. Now, it's much more difficult to do this legally. Let's move on. FMLA stands for the Family and Medical Leave Act of 1996, which was a major advance in employee rights. However, those rights are only given under certain circumstances. 
The major implication of this law is that an employee must be given unpaid leave for up to 12 weeks in any 12-month period to care for the birth or care of a newborn child. And this is what people commonly refer to as maternity leave. Technically, there is no such thing as maternity leave, and such leave is available to either the father or the mother. It also gives leave for the adoption or new foster care of a child, or for the care of an immediate family member like a spouse, child, or parent, but not a sibling or a cousin unless that person is a legal dependent and you are their legal guardian. So let's see, who are we forgetting here? It covers the child, the parent, the spouse. Oh yeah, what about the actual employee? So yes, it also gives leave to a person to care for their own serious health issue. Recently, this was amended to give up to 26 weeks of leave to a family member who is giving care to a returning military member. But in both of these instances, either 12 weeks or 26 weeks, the leave is unpaid. However, the employee taking leave gets to keep their health benefits and must be given a similar or equivalent job with similar or equivalent duties, work hours, responsibilities, and pay when they return. In the best of all worlds, they get their former job back, but sometimes a company is forced to hire someone else to do the job of the employee who is on leave, and the returning employee may have to do another job instead of their old one. Just as a side note, leave policies differ greatly around the world. In Austria, for example, both the mother and father of a newborn child get two years of paid leave. This is a tremendous expense for a company, but in countries with declining birth rates, it might be quite important to facilitate childbirth and parenthood. Let's move on. Well, if you weren't tired of alphabet suit yet, in 2010, Congress passed the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which is also known as Obamacare. As Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi said at the time, they had to pass it so they could find out what's in it. Well, now we know. Just a note on some abbreviations in this slide. ER stands for employer. EE stands for employee. Thus, these acronyms are formed by the last two letters of the word, ER and EE. The main points of the law are that firms can be fined if they do not provide health care insurance to their employees if they have 50 or more employees and if those employees work 30 or more hours per week. Employers with 200 or more employees must automatically enroll their employees in their health insurance plans. Employers must also provide health care for dependent children until they are 26 years old. Oh my. One more incentive to move home after college, live in mom's attic, and play World of Warcraft all day long, I guess. On the bright side, essential health care like annual physicals and such cannot require a deductible or a copay. This law is trying to incentivize preventative care. Also, it prohibits any limits on lifetime benefits for key health coverage. That means that one's insurance coverage cannot be capped for most issues like catastrophic care. Lastly, one's insurance cannot be canceled because of honest mistakes by the employer or the employee. That too is a good thing. Let's move on. On the next several slides, we'll describe a way of classifying types of benefits, thereby creating a sort of a typology of plans. All benefit plans are either legally required or discretionary. They are either contributory or non-contributory. They are either qualified or non-qualified. And lastly, they're either defined benefit or defined contribution. These terms will be explained at length on the following slides. However, each plan can be categorized by four dichotomous dimensions. 
yielding a two by two by two by two typology, resulting in 16 different types of plans. However, some of the cells in a typology box are unlikely to have any plans at all. For example, no plan comes to my mind that is legally required, contributory, non-qualified, and defined contribution. Maybe there is, but I can't think of it. Let's move on. Legally required benefit plans include the aforementioned Social Security, the Family and Medical Leave Act provisions, the Older Workers Benefit Protection Act, but also two other not yet mentioned types of benefits. The first of these benefits is unemployment insurance, which is a federal payroll tax on both the employer and employee and is legally required. However, the tax is refunded to states which individually administer their own unemployment compensation programs. Of course, it's no surprise that weekly benefit amounts vary from state to state. To qualify for such benefits, you must be involuntarily unemployed, which makes you eligible for up to 26 weeks of unemployment benefits. Your benefits are based on your recent earnings. Additionally, Unemployed workers are required to seek, quote, suitable employment, unquote, and must be willing and able to work. The second of these other benefits is workers' compensation insurance, which is a federal or state mandated insurance and is legally required in every state except Texas. It is provided to workers to defray the loss of income and the cost of treatment due to work-related injuries or illness. But not all employers pay the same rates for this coverage. Factors influencing the employer's insurance rate include the risk of injury or illness for an occupation, the company's frequency and severity of employee injuries, the company so-called experience rating, so companies operating in dangerous industries like coal mining and with a history of accidents and claims pay more than companies operating in low-risk industries with little or no history of claims. The discretionary benefits include things like health care, well, sort of, only for firms with fewer than 50 employees who work fewer than 30 hours a week is health care health insurance discretionary. That is, less than 50 employees who work less than 30 hours a week, you do not have to provide health insurance to them if you're an employer. Other discretionary benefits include pay for time not worked, like sick leave, personal day, and vacations. Not every company provides those sorts of things. Some firms offer life insurance, but they don't have to. It's discretionary. Some firms provide employee assistance programs or EAPs to help with counseling, alcohol problems, and financial distress. Other firms find it advantageous to willfully provide child and elder care for their employees. Some firms provide pensions or contributions to retirement plans like 401k plans. Big firms tend to provide more benefits than do small companies. Most benefit plans are designed, at least in part, to effectively recruit applicants and to keep employees from leaving. Let's move on. Some plans are contributory and some are non-contributory. In a contributory plan, both the employer and the employee contribute to the plan. This could mean that both the employer and the employee share in the cost of health care insurance, or they both must contribute to the retirement plan, or they both, etc., etc. These sorts of plans are quite common in the public sector, like government agencies and universities. In a non-contributory plan, only the employer makes or pays for the contribution. This is a pretty sweet deal since the employee contributes or pays nothing. These are quite common in the private sector. Let's move on.
Now we have the qualified versus non-qualified dichotomy. This refers to whether or not the plan is qualified for protection under ERISA and IRS guidelines. Only a fool would want their pension to not be safeguarded by government protection. I'm not talking about retirement plans where the employees pick the investment firm for their self, but rather about pensions that a business pays to you from their own investment when you retire. Not all pension plans are up to snuff, so to speak. So they do not all get government protection. If your employer provides a pension, not just a contribution to a 401k, but an actual pension, make sure it's a qualified plan. Or if the company makes some unwise investments, your pension could go down the tubes. Qualified plans can be further broken down into defined benefit or defined contribution, and we'll discuss those on the next slide, so stay tuned. On the other hand, non-qualified plans simply do not meet ERISA guidelines. Often a company will have a qualified plan for its rank and file employees, and then offer so-called gold-plated plans for its executives. These gold-plated plans that offer X millions of dollars to executives when they retire are most often non-qualified. Some non-profit firms also offer non-qualified plans, not just for executives, but also for lower-level employees, too. There is no preferential tax treatment for the recipients of non-qualified plans, but business deductions for expenses paid to plans are tax-deferred until the plan is paid out, at which point the company must pay taxes on it. Let's move on. Okay, here now we'll examine the difference between a defined benefit and a defined contribution plan. In a defined benefit plan, the employee is guaranteed a definite or defined benefit. That is, they are paid a fixed benefit predetermined by the employer. There are no individual accounts, so to speak. The company simply manages a pool of funds from which they will someday have to pay their retirees. Thus, the risk is on the employer. They must make wise decisions because they are obligated by contract to pay a specific dollar amount to each retirement someday. These plans fall under the protection of the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. That is, they may fall under the ERISA law if they meet certain government requirements. However, as some companies age and their business takes a nosedive, some employees get worried that their pension may not be there when they retire. If the pension is covered by ERISA, then the PBGC will step in and pay the retiree even if the company goes out of business or simply cannot pay its retirees. That's a good thing. In a defined contribution plan, either the employer, the employee, or both make a definite, specific, defined contribution to a retirement plan and hope that the money is there when the employee actually retires. These are indeed individual accounts, and the employee can choose their own investments within certain limitations, usually set by the company. This places the risk solely on the employee. They must choose wise investments, and they must manage their funds because the company is off the hook with regard to paying anything more than their definite contribution. These plans are not guaranteed by the government or the employer, for that matter. Let's move on. Even though retirement plans can be characterized as either defined benefit or defined contribution plans, I'm not done yet with providing information on them. The issue of vesting is important. Vesting gives one the right to actually draw from their retirement plan when they retire. It's a guarantee that one can get one's money when they retire. Usually the vesting period is one year but it can be even as long as five years for some companies. That means that even though the company and even the employee may contribute to some retirement fund, if the employee resigns or is fired before they are vested, the company's contribution to the fund is withdrawn. 
Of course, you still get to keep the money that you contributed, but the company's match is withdrawn. ERISA actually requires that vesting be stated and enforced so that companies cannot jack you around by firing you the day before you retire and saving their share of 30 years of contributions. With the economic crisis of 2008, many firms went out of business, refused to continue matching employee contributions to pension plans, or somehow got away with borrowing money from their pension plan to engage in risky business so that there was and still a major fear that inadequate funds might someday overwhelm the PBGC. For a couple of years after the crisis, General Motors paid more for the health insurance of its unionized retirees than it did for raw materials like steel, plastic, and rubber. Because of things like this, very few companies offer actual pensions anymore and instead offer defined contribution plans like the 401k, with or without employer matching. Let's move on. There are far too many types of retirement plans to cover here, but here's a few. First, we have the prototypical 401k plan, which in the nonprofit sector is usually called the 403b plan. In this plan, the employees make contributions and the employers usually, but not always, match some or all of the contribution. If your employer matches your contribution, they are effectively doubling how much money you put into the plan which can provide a giant bonus on top of any sort of investment revenues generated by a wise selection of investment vehicles. The moral of this story is, if they match it, take advantage of it. However, this is not a defined benefit plan, so there is no guarantee on the rate of return. Most firms will limit the sort of investments in which they will allow you, and if they engage in matching, in which they will invest, but choose wisely. On the bright side of this, it is a form of tax-deferred savings. That is, any money put into the plans comes out of your paycheck before income tax. So it typically reduces your income tax liability for the year. On the downside, when you take money out of the plan, you do pay income taxes on it at the rate for the year in which you withdraw it. Generally, people find themselves in a lower tax bracket when they retire because their salary is no more. So it's really another sort of increase in your rate of return. The maximum amount that you contribute varies every year, but recently it was increased. The 401k is a discretionary, contributory, non-qualified, and defined contribution plan. Another sort of tax-deferred plan is the KEO plan, which is also called an HR10 plan. This plan, however, is for small businesses or for those who are self-employed. Think about it. If you are self-employed, I'm sorry, if you are self-employed, your employer is you. So you don't get the benefit of having someone else match your contribution to a retirement plan like with the 401k plan. With this plan, the maximum contribution is much higher than with the Roth IRA, which will be described below. It, too, changes over time, but recently it had a maximum of $49,000 annually. Again, the contributions are solely made by the employee, but on the plus side, it is tax deferred. So contributions to this plan come out of your income before taxes this year but at whatever rate you find yourself in when you decide to use it. The KEO plan is discretionary, contributory, non-qualified, and defined contribution. I say it's contributory because you and the employer are the same thing. So when you contribute, then the employer also contributes. The Roth Individual Retirement Account is a very different form of retirement plan than a 401k or a KEO. With the Roth IRA, the contributions are taxed up front, but withdrawn tax-free. That is, they're taxed at what is usually a higher tax rate when you are working, but withdrawn at what is usually a lower rate when you are retired. The tax rate in the future will likely be lower because of the tiered 
and progressive nature of our tax code. If your income is high, you usually find yourself in a higher tax bracket with a higher tax rate than those who earn less income. Of course, that's not true for everyone. Wouldn't it be great if one's income increased after they retire? In that case, the Roth IRA proceeds and withdrawals are tax-free. So it's not tax deferred. As with the 401k, the maximum amount you can contribute changes every year, but recently it was increased annually if you are younger than 50 and even allows for a higher contribution annually if you are 50 and older. The Roth is discretionary, non-contributory, non-qualified, and defined contribution with a sort of calculatable defined benefit later to it if you fully expect to make less money when you're retired than when you are working. Let's move on. Well, thanks. That's all for now. 